Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And occasionally, occasionally, I have my nemesis onto the channel so that we can discuss something fun about narrative. And in this case, it is going to be uh, an archetype. We're going to talk about the orphan, Philip, Dr. Fantasy himself. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Did you just say that you had your nemesis on the channel so that you could discuss something fun, but also something intelligent, right? We had to keep the uh, the the uh, the conversation elevated here, don't we? Do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. So we we had finished off the the Jungian literary archetypes uh, that discussion, yes. and that that video was on your channel because uh, we just yes. we discussed the hero, the villain, the follower, and the everyman. Yes, but now we're kind of moving beyond that Jungian sort of aspect of, and we're going to talk about some of the more general archetypes that we we find, and very much linked to the hero, is this. Uh, some people will call it a trope, but uh, this aspect of the orphan, right? And I think we find this in a lot of fantasy, and we find it in different ways, and we find it in mythology as well. So before I ramble on about all of this <laughs> Bella, what do you think about this like why are we talking about this one what is so special about the orphan yeah so we are going to mention loads of examples and there are so many of them as you said from mythology and legend and folk tales but obviously even even from superhero comics and and you name it it's just it is so pervasive this pattern but of course it's big in fantasy this, it is a pattern because it's not just the fact that the character is an orphan. There is a, a sequence of events involved here and that tell you, I think somewhat might, what the psychological function of this pattern might be, which makes it an archetype, not just a, a cliche or a trope, I suppose. But when you look at it closely, when you compare all these orphans, there seems to be a, a psychological function. You can approach this, by the way, from both a Freudian perspective, uh, but also a Jungian one. There's, a, a, of course, Joseph Campbell, well known in the hero's journey. And I think the, the, being the orphan part of that is a well known part of it, but also there's a uh, <clears throat> guy called Otto Rank um, who talked about orphans as part of the hero's journey as well. And he was a Freudian and he had a, a very different it's about getting back to the mother and, and all that kind of stuff. You, you can imagine where that goes, but, mm -hmm. um, but, but there's a lot you can do with this. And the pattern includes the idea of the, the, the loneliness, the longing to belong to something larger than oneself. The, uh, obviously it plays into the found family trope, which is a very common one in fantasy as well. But the idea that we could, we, we would, automatically uh, our, our, our empathy, our sympathy goes out to this figure who may have experienced some traumatic loss early in life. And so we like this figure to begin with, but we also want to see this figure find herself in the world and find her tribe and, and, and find where she belongs. And, and we, we go along with that. And somehow I think that makes us feel good too. Uh, so we vicariously experience that sense of belonging that can happen for this this figure this person who starts out losing so much and then finding a family so it's a very powerful impulse i think in storytelling and so i think it does perform a very big psychological function which is maybe why it's just so pervasive and and, and certainly that at that point of connection where when a the central protagonist is orphaned or is presented as orphan that psychological connection where you you feel empathy and sympathy for them that they have been removed from a structure and yeah. a support group so we can see that as that connection with the uh with the reader the narrative and why authors or, or writers use that as a point of sympathy to to gain your trust to yeah. get you to buy into the narrative to get you to support this character but we also see it in historical terms because uh, quite often in mythology in legend there is something special about the birth of this character and yes. it ties into the chosen one trope as well mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. an aspect often of a hero is that there is something special 
about their birth. Their birth is different. There's something going on. Uh, right. But even like Achilles uh, is reborn in uh, the river, apart from obviously his heel, uh, which <laughs> remains mortal, but he is reborn. Uh, we have in the Toyn, in the, the Ulster uh, cycle. Yeah. The teal, there's a confusion about who Cúhollin was when he was born. There are multiple versions of his birth. Yeah. Uh, the story of, of Heracles, the special birth that he was so much larger than his twin, that in some way his birth was marked as special. Right. And so many of these characters, uh, these legendary characters, have something very, very special about their birth that singles them out as different, as important. Yeah. And what we see in the orphan is similar to that. So Vin in um, the Mistborn, the Final Empire, uh -huh. doesn't have a family. She is a, a foundling. She is a, a uh, an orphan. Luke Skywalker, double orphan, because yeah. not only does he not know who his parents are? Uh, he's been raised by his aunt and his uncle, and then they get offed. Yeah. Um, we have Ray in the Star Wars sequels. They replicate it. Yeah. This they idea replicate. of the the orphan. Finn yeah. in the Star Wars sequels is again an yeah. orphan because he was raised to be a stormtrooper. He doesn't have a family. All yeah. of these things isolate the character, and it remain it then serves a narrative function mm -hmm. because their support is stripped away. They have nothing to lose about going on the quest. And that I think is one of the advantages uh, to using the orphan as a style of protagonist yeah. because it frees them up to go on the quest, to go on the adventure. If yeah. their entire world is meaningless behind them, they don't have a family, they don't have a home, they are rootless. They have no reason to stay. They have every reason to go forward and they can find friends, family, and a reason for being as they go on their quest. So we can yeah. see how all of these things kind of play into each other. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it also, you mentioned the chosen one trope. And I think there's a sense in which having the main character be an orphan plays very much into the idea that the protagonist is somehow special. And this is something that we readers also obviously identify with. We want to identify with the, the hero who is in some sense special. So Arthur, King Arthur, it was an orphan. And he's the one who can pull the sword out of the stone and which shows you, you know, he's destined for greatness, that sort of thing. Uh, you very much see that in Harry Potter. Uh, Harry Potter is the boy who lived. He, you know, there's something special about this character who, who is different, who is marked in some way or other as uh, being different from other ordinary people who's going to accomplish something great. Great hope is placed in this character. So again, you see that coming from the circumstances of being an orphan where there's so much lost to a place where there could be so much gained. I think that's that's a powerful thing. And uh, you, you, it goes way back and you see it in superhero comics. Uh, you see it in a uh, Beowulf, for example, begins with the story of Shield Shaving, who is a, a, an orphan. He's a foundling. Um, but Superman, Batman, right? Uh, and you mentioned Wonder Woman as well, who's- uh, Wonder Woman's way. origin is slightly different because- A different, obviously, yeah. Well, yeah. One of the origin stories is that she's made of clay and then life is yeah. breathed into her, uh, but yeah. she doesn't have that traditional family. She is on right. her own and that's, it marks her out as different. It marks her out as special. And yeah. without that family unit, without that sense of community that other people have, there is yeah. that heroic drive to go forward, to do something different, that they are marked out. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and we see this, of course, in, in classical literature with, with characters like Oliver Twist um, and, and that sort of thing. And a lot of fantasy authors will just plug right into that. For example, Kvothe from The Name of the Wind, very much an Oliver Twist kind of figure there, isn't he? I mean, that's one thing that Patrick Rothfuss does, I think pretty well, actually, is getting us to, um, feel for this character by all the crazy bad things that happened to this poor kid, right? And of course, being a kid is more vulnerable and all of that. But we immediately 
you know, our hearts leap out for this character because of that status and because of the just one thing after another. It's like this poor kid, nothing goes right, you know. Um, so Sorry, are, we, are, very... are we talking about both or are we talking about fit chivalry from Robin Hobb? Oh, there you go. I mean, there's another one. Uh, exactly the pattern. And um, it, there is something powerful about that, that sense of loss that that gets our hearts. And we're rooting for this character so very hard at that point, aren't we? Yeah. And but even if we think of a Althea Vestrit in uh, the uh, live ship trilogy, she's yeah. not she's not an orphan in that, you know, both her parents are dead. But you have that sense of her being orphaned, of being cut off from her family. So mm -hmm. not literally being the orphan, but you can see the uh, the archetype at play. Because again, yeah. it's separate, cutting off from roots, setting the, the heroic character on a journey where they are going to learn, they're going to grow, they're going to find these things. Yep. And you can see that that's why this is so attractive. That's why it gets used so many times. It fits yep. with that narrative arc of... Uh, the hero's journey. It fits with the Bildungsroman. It it fits with um, even uh, Freytag's pyramid. All, all of these things, tracing out the, the journey of a hero, fits so neatly when the hero is cast adrift. Yeah. What is their impetus to go out there? Cut away their support. Cut away their community. Leave them on their own. And they have a desire for those things that they do not have. And you can do all of that with an orphan. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't even have, like you said, so Althea is an example of someone who hasn't actually lost both. She loses a parent, but not both. And when you have Ged in A Wizard of Mercy, his mother is from the very beginning absent because she died. But the, and there is a father who's, who's around, but he's a very absent father. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a character who's completely orphaned either. Um, but that, that same idea of, of not having the sense of belonging and, and not having this and, and having to go out and find that somewhere, having to go out and find that in the process of a quest. That is the end goal of the quest, in a sense, is to find oneself, even as one helps save the world. You know, so that's a big part of it, isn't it? Yeah. And but even if we think of the Lord of the Rings, um, Frodo, Frodo is raised by his uncle Bilbo. Yep. Um, when He's we an think. Orphan. Yeah. It, he's an orphan. He has a, a he has been marked out at birth as something different, something special. Yeah. Um. It, well, you know, with there are certain series that I don't want to mention this about because it comes up as a plot point. Um. Oh. Ones where it is obvious quite early on. I don't mind talking about, but I don't want to ruin other books for people. But yeah. um. Again, like I, I go back to Eddings for this as a very stereotypical example because Eddings oh. uses archetypes so readily in his work and Garion is staying on the farm with his aunt Paul that mm. again he is a foundling he is a an orphan yeah. uh, he uh, he is marked with a silver birthmark yeah. uh, which is a, another thing we'll, we'll probably get to about uh, the uh, trope of having the special mark signaling uh, signaling that you're the chosen one but yeah. Garion is again that uh, in search of a mother, in search of a father, in search of a family. That yeah. is a, a driving psychological uh, position for him. Yeah. Um, so Lionel, which uh, I talked about in another video, <laughs> yeah. again, like, his family's all dead and he's left with these people who are kind of raising him. Uh, oh, he's fuck. destined to be the hero. Uh, uh -huh. We already talked about Luke Skywalker and Rey. Yeah. You. you watching films you trip over this so many times when there's meant to be the heroic character now you don't right. need to go as far as like eliminating an entire planet like krypton but yeah. again the foster family and the foundling we can see that playing into that bruce yeah. wayne like his psychology of seeing his parents being murdered yeah is what drives him to be batman exactly but again it's the it's the orphan uh, being rudderless in this world but with both Superman and Batman, we see that uh, Superman had Jonathan Martha Kent. Batman mm -hmm. had Alfred. It's not that they are completely divorced from all of these things, yeah, yeah. but they have something in their childhood that is setting them apart um, yeah. and gives them that drive. 
Yeah, I'm a more of a Marvel guy, so we'll go with Peter Parker and his Aunt May. Um, it's the same thing, right? But um, Peter, Peter Parker is living with his Aunt May and his Uncle Ben, and even then, they still have to kill Uncle Ben. I know, poor Uncle Ben, man. But that's, again, to give him the values that anchor him. You know, that's a big, and to live up to that, um, I think, is an important part of his, his, his heroic journey. But there, there are so many good ones that are, I, I, I feel like, fairly complex to um, ones like Shadow Moon in um, uh, American Gods, for example. Um, but you had something you wanted to say, yeah. Yeah, just before we get on to that, one of the, the psychological tricks and one of the, the narrative tricks that gets played with when you create an orphan character, when there's an orphan character, is yeah. the mysterious parentage. Uh huh. And that leaves open a lot of things. If they're going with the chosen one, if they're going to go with a line of heroes or all this, you have a mysterious parentage because an orphan, we do not know the parents. We don't know what the parents were like. We don't know who they were. All of these things are mysteries that can be solved within a narrative. And yeah. when you have mysterious parents, you can have like a scene in The Empire Strikes Back where uh -huh. it is a shock to the audience. Yeah. Um, when you have the mysterious parents uh, where we know nothing about, we can see that being used where there is a sudden reveal. Arthur, uh, if you remember, uh, even the Disney version, doesn't uh -huh. really know that he is the uh, destined king, that right. he comes from this uh, lineage. He's very much Wart, the, the little kid. And then it's revealed that, oh no, you're actually descended from a line of kings and you are the true king. And yeah. um, we see that in so many things where it's suddenly revealed that this orphan who had been living this life gets the magical parents. Right. They, they right. find out that they were special. They did come from somewhere. And that's the tradition that they're now growing into. So yeah. that's something that really does get played with a lot with this particular uh, archetype. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can use the archetype for new things, too, I think. So I was mentioning Shadow Moon in, in American Gods. And what Neil Gaiman does is he takes so it's it's obvious early on that Shadow is is an orphan. He he doesn't know who his father was and his mother died when he was still a teenager. So he's an, he basically is it fits that orphan uh, archetype. But I also love how that book does a lot with identity, and particularly in this this country where I am right now, um, there's a lot of, I think we Americans think more about identity, perhaps, because we're such a, a hodgepodge, perhaps, uh, that might be part of it. But th that is also part of Shadow's quest of figuring out who he is. There is the mystery of, of his parentage. But on top of that, there's this idea of identity, and that's a very modern uh, obsession. That's a very modern consideration. This this question of identity, um, you see it in the Poppy War trilogy with the character Rin. She's an orphan uh, from the very beginning, and that is a it's a big part of the trauma of her journey too. I think uh, as it gets revealed more and more about who she is and who she was, it becomes more and more important, the fact that uh, she is an orphan. So that it takes on resonance there. Um, there are some series that uh, use this ar uh, archetype a little bit, and in, in again, uh, a kind of a uh, subversive way. Uh, you have some in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, some, some prominent orphans, Crocus, for example. Uh, uh, Crocus is, is a great example of this. Again, raised by his uncle, his uncle Mamet. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's there's an interesting discussion there. Um, and, and again, what happens to the person that raises the orphans? It, it never it doesn't seem to bode well for a lot of them. No, no, but, you don't want to be that in a story. No. Um, and this is something we also see with the, the orphan type because they don't have the parental figures. It leaves that narrative space for the guiding figure to step in and be the mentor. Hmm. Uh, Pug in Magician uh, is an orphan and he's the keep boy. And although he has foster parents, uh, basically when it comes to the choosing, the court magician, Colgan, uh, sort of takes pity on him and goes, well, you could be my apprentice. Didn't really want an apprentice, but that starts that whole thing where we have um, Mara of the Akoma, even though she's basically 18, she's about to take holy orders. When her 
father and brother die and she's left alone. She is orphaned and left without uh, the support of her family. Hmm. She has to move beyond the traditional bounds of the society. And this is the other thing. When the parents are removed, when there's this special uh, isolation of the, the central character, yeah. one of the things that they can do is move beyond the traditional bounds or the structures of the society to be someone different, to be an individual, because they're not being shaped by their parents. They're not leading a normal life where you're going to grow up and you're going to meet the, the person of your dreams and then you're going to get married and then you're going to have kids and perpetuate yeah. the cycle. As an orphan, that's been cut off. You're outside of that in yeah. these narratives. Yeah, and yet, I think there's a sense in which this whole orphan archetype thing does feed into the hero's journey of growing up and becoming a responsible individual, right? Mm -hmm. Becoming the, the uh, coming into one's powers, which we talked about when we did the hero ar archetype before. Um, and and it, it does add an additional layer, I think, to that journey, which is perhaps why it's so, so common and so commonly linked to the hero archetype, I, I, I think. So. Yeah, and it, traditionally, we do see it isolated to the protagonist. Um, right. it, it's interesting, uh, some of the more modern takes where they've played with it quite often have both hero and villain have been orphaned or are some way connected in that, that they were separated at birth, they were twins, and one has become evil and one has become good. Right. Uh, and authors like to play with that to show that dualism. But again, it's the flexibility of it, where you have a point of sympathy and empathy that you can play with to bring your reader in. You are freeing the character up from the standard way that someone in that world is Predomin uh, presumably meant to be raised, that they can go on an adventure and do something different. They're not bound by the same structures and expectations because they don't have that familial unit. There is a drive to find family, to find what is missing in their life. They, they have this hole and they're seeking something for it. And that is a, an impetus for them to leave. Yeah. Um, and it allows that narrative space for a mentor to come in to fulfill mm -hmm. the role that a parent probably would have filled. Mm -hmm. So you can see how useful it is in all of these different senses. Yeah. And also how flexible it is when authors want to play with it, when they want to complicate the notion. Yeah, well said. Yeah, it is the archetype that sets up a lot of other archetypes and um, and and gives them additional resonance, I think. So, yeah, excellent. And that's a nice actually observation you made, too, because it does show you how not only do these archetypes take many different forms, but how much they relate to one another and how they can interlock. Um, so you have individual characters who can exhibit traits of various archetypes, um, but you also have archetypes that feed into each other um so it's it's a fairly complex thing in, in terms of how narrative works and how these archetypes can be discussed as ways to enhance understanding of characters and to enhance understanding of certain uh patterns that we see in narrative and to try to understand why they're there and, and i think that's one of the big attractions honestly to studying literature why do we tell stories this way with this repetition of these certain themes and and and, and figures and patterns so that's it's uh, something that's a lot of fun to think about well and i and i think we, we've had quite a good discussion of this again we're, we're trying to keep it compact this is an introduction to these things we're not trying okay. to to cover absolutely everything no but uh Thank you so much, Philip. I think this has been a great start to the next part of our journey into yeah. these, these archetypes and tropes. So thank you yeah. very much for joining me. All right, brilliant. Thank you, AP. And for those of you still watching, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.